This is the Rational Reminder Podcast, a weekly reality check on sensible investing and financial decision-making for Canadians. We are hosted by me, Benjamin Felix, and Cameron Passmore. So I'm getting a new car. I'm going to get the Subaru Ascent, leasing it. Which hurts for you. I... I don't know if it does hurt. I'm, I'm, I mean, I made a pretty deliberate decision to lease. We we bought the last one, used also a Subaru, but now I've got this vehicle that I own, and I want a new one, but I own the old one, and I have to do something with it. Do I trade it in? Do I sell so it? So how did you come to terms with leasing instead of buying it outright? Well, if I'm gonna get a new vehicle, every whatever five years, which I don't know, is reasonable i think every five years especially with all the new technology coming out in vehicles uh if i'm buying i'm just it's the same thing i'm just paying for the depreciation right. but basically. most people don't understand the math of leasing true and how you're basically leaving the residual cost down the road paying the interest on the residual cost and prepaying a certain amount of mileage each year so i think that's where most people get confused is in paying for more mileage than you're actually going to be using. So depending on your high or low mileage, I mean, you're probably a normal mileage user. Probably low. I walk to work. Susan takes the kids to school and goes to Whole Foods maybe. Yeah, so you can choose and at the end of the lease if you want to. to just buy it out if you like it. If you don't want it, you just give it back and try to hang on to some of the equity if you're way under the mileage. Right. And that's it, people. I've had a number of conversations this past week with people who didn't know that if they're way under their mileage on a lease, you actually have embedded equity. I didn't know that. What does that mean? So if you're leasing your, your new vehicle and you pay for effectively 20,000 kilometers a year, after four years in a typical lease, they probably have a residual value of 40%. Huh. Right? So let's say you you buy your, your truck for 30,000. They're going to say in four years' time it's worth 40% of 30,000, so 12 grand will be your buyout. But if you show up in four years' time and you've only got 30,000 kilometers on it, it's worth way more than 12. You want to make sure. So let's say it might be worth in the marketplace 16 grand so you have four thousand dollars of embedded equity you want to make sure you're able to keep that equity and roll it into your next vehicle because that car is worth more down the road oh i didn't know that didn't know that so it's all about the equity and it's so it's just it's just math right in the end that's what i tell people i mean so many people lease because it enables them to get into a fancier car for the same monthly payment and you get used to making that payment and that works in a low interest rate environment because less of that payment will be interest. Right. But in a high interest rate environment, if you're buying, say, a $60,000 car that's worth 30000 in four years' time, you're paying the interest on that whole sixty right. plus a depreciation on that car. The main thing is to hang on to your equity down the road. And if, if you know you want to buy your, your car long term, why not lease it? You have the choice in four years' time to buy it out at a preset value. Right. And carry on if you like it. If you don't like it, you give it back. So I, I've always been a leaser. I think when you look at the numbers, if you're if you're going to buy, especially used, if you're going to buy used and keep the vehicle for 15 years or something like that, I mean, at the end of 15 years, it's a pretty rough vehicle. But if you're going to do that, yes, financially, that's better than, than leasing. But if you like having a half-decent vehicle, I don't know, leasing seems like way less of a headache. I agree. The main thing is understand what equity you have at the end of the day and don't give up on that equity. Yeah, that's interesting. Didn't know that. So I I tell people, any financial kind of decision that you're making, why not reach out to us? Like we're fee-based, so you're paying for some level of service anyway, so why not reach out to us? Clients, not not anybody, clients. Yeah, not anybody, but clients. (laughs) We don't charge fees to, (laughs) yeah. Uh, There's a report from Mortgage Professionals Canada that came out uh, last week. And they were raising a bunch of concerns about the new stress tests for mortgages. They said that 100,000 people have already been prevented from buying a home based on the new stress tests. What do you think about that? So I was doing some poking around on this, and it sounds like cheaper houses are going up a lot in value because now people have to move down market Interesting. to pass the stress test, which effectively says you have to be able to handle a 2% increase in rates yeah, I think so. and still meet the affordability test. Um, I listened to a mortgage broker show on the weekend, and and they were saying that markets have slowed down 
due to this, but I just saw another article saying that it has it in like Ottawa and I think Ottawa and Montreal is strong. Yeah. And the lower end of the market in, in Vancouver and Toronto is also strong as people are going down market. Because of the stress tests? Because of the stress tests. Yeah, that's really interesting. Uh, second order effect. Uh, in that Mortgage Professionals Canada report, they're kind of raising concerns about increasing wealth inequality because people can't buy houses and uh you know, we've we've done some work on that in the past, and and th- there's no there's no reason to believe that buying a home is an automatic path to to wealth. Uh, you can do just as well renting. Uh, I think the biggest difference is that renting takes a ton of discipline to actually Correct. build wealth because you have to save your money and invest. And if, and if people love their portfolio as much as they love their house, right, and put a bunch of debt on top of it, so you get uh, like borrow to invest, borrow to invest, yeah. they would do much better. But people don't love their portfolios. And also, you don't get a monthly statement from your house showing you what the value is. So there's great behavior reasons to own a house for sure. Right. And you look at other wealthy countries or developed countries, whatever you want to call them. Uh, the US home ownership rate is 64%. Canada, 67. Germany, 51, 51.7%. Switzerland, 42.5%. So there are other developed countries where people are doing just fine without owning real estate as much as Canadians do. Canadians fall uh, right in the middle of G20 countries. Right. Yeah, I, I like owning my house. I enjoy having my place. So I get utility out of that. It's not a, an economic decision necessarily for me. I wanted a place for the family and our own space that I like working on. Do you think you'll keep? You're very different than that, though. Do you think you'll keep owning when the kid? I mean, the kids are almost out of the house. No. Do you think you'll keep owning? No. You'll sell and rent. I think so. Interesting. I rent for now. We were talking earlier though about how Susan and I have devised a plan where we're going to completely max out all of our registered accounts, RSP, TFSAs, RESP, and once those are maxed out, is when we'll start saving more aggressively for a for a house, but. But that's a very logical, analytical decision, whereas we Correct. know home buying is a very emotional decision. You're right. And a lot of people who are choosing to rent are probably not focusing all of their energy on maxing out their RSP and TFSA. No. no. <laughs> yeah. Although many are. We have a lot of younger clients that are very good, great savings habits. Yeah, but our client set is a very yes. biased sample um, because that's why they're our clients. So this Amazon story never goes away, does it? Yeah. Every week someone talks about Amazon. I even saw an article the other day talking about how Amazon is getting into our space, more and more financial services. Be it I've been saying that for a be while. It, yeah. Be it checking accounts. And it's only a matter of time, I think, until they get into the investment asset management business, I would think. But I've been reading that for years. Google's going to do that apparently, eventually. It's all speculation, though. So this is a winner-take-all question, right? That And you saw an article on BNN and Bloomberg last week? Yeah. Well, we've had this question, so it's always interesting to see other people writing about it. But yeah, on BNN and Blo- Bloomberg had an article with kind of a funny title. Uh, it said, Amazon's eating the world and the stock market. Uh, Amazon is huge. Uh, Apple's also huge. There's there's uh, speculation on which company is going to reach a trillion dollars in market cap. Yeah. First, which is obviously a massive uh, valuation. So you being you, you go back and test the data. Yeah. Well, we and there's were, some pretty cool data points you came up with. We wanted to see how unprecedented is the size of these companies uh, based on what we've seen in the past. So, you know, technology is making up a bigger and bigger part of the market. Uh, we, we went way back uh, 1900, in 1900, about... I'd say 50 is a pie chart, so I, I don't have the exact number, but I'd say somewhere between 50 and 60% of the U.S. stock market was rail companies in 1900. Amazing. Uh, also in 1900, Standard Oil had an inflation adjusted, if we adjust for inflation to today, had a valuation of $1 trillion. Amazing. Um, and then we looked back, not quite as far as that, but 20 years ago, just to see kind of what was going on in the market right then. in the bubble. Yeah, that's right. Um, right, but yeah, beginning of it, I guess, nearing nearing the crash, 1998. So July 1998, the largest market capitalization company in the United States was AT and T, and they're, I mean, not not the largest now. Right. Uh, they were followed by GE. And look what happened to GE. Was it last week or two weeks ago? Pulled out of they were removed from the Dow index. Re- oh yeah. Replaced with Walgreens. Wow. So the iconic GE is not in the Dow index. Wow, interesting. 
Um, if we adjust for inflation, AT&T's 1998 valuation market cap would have been $504 billion, which is kind of close to what Facebook was before they dropped uh, earlier this week. Um, in, in 1998, AT&T made up 3.4% of the total U.S. market cap. And as of June 2018, Apple was 2.6 percent. That's amazing. Yeah, it was really interesting. Who would have we, thought? We pulled a chart or created a chart where we looked at the ratio of the largest company in the United States as a percentage of the overall U.S. market cap, and it's been pretty stable over time. It's not like you know we hear the the winner take all question. It's not like there's been a winner take all environment where the, the largest companies are just taking over the whole entire stock market. It's been a, a pretty stable relationship around, I don't know, 3%. Um, and it's not just the largest company. We also looked at the five largest companies. So in 1998, the five largest companies made up 11.6% of the U.S. market. Five largest companies today? 115 Almost exactly the same. <laughs> so there's nothing to see here, basically. Nothing to see. I mean, we've seen large, successful companies in the past. And I'm not saying that Apple and Amazon aren't changing the world. They, they are. Uh, they're innovating. And they're doing stuff that other companies haven't done before. Same as Facebook with their mission of connecting whatever their mission is, connecting everybody, uh, regardless of the cost. But I was listening to Barry Ritholtz's podcast this morning yep. with Rob Arnott. Yep. Great podcast. And he was talking about how Domino's, and I forget the time period. We can go back and get oh, it. Oh, that's great, yeah. For a certain time period, Domino's has actually outperformed Apple. I think it's the last five years or something. It might even be longer than that. But yeah, I saw that data point too. So you, you just don't know where the outperformance is going to be. Yeah. Um, on that same thread, we looked at the five largest companies in the U.S. in 1998. And if you had invested in those then, obviously, you know, same kind of question as Amazon right now. It's the biggest company. Should you invest in that company? In terms of market cap, the five largest companies are now ranked 18th, 44th, 5th, 27th, and 10th in the market. So obviously, they have not hung on to their title as the largest companies. Um, and then speaking of like major innovation, you know, we're talking about Amazon. What are they doing? They're they're providing scale and allowing people to access products easily, cheaply. I guess. Um, you look at the Dutch East India Company in the 1600s, and they were like opening up global trade. Where did you find this? Uh, visual Visual Capitalist had a nice post on the largest market cap companies. You're going back almost 500 years. Well, it's amazing. So you think about <laughs> what, what Amazon's doing today and what Apple's doing today, and yeah, it's it's really it, no different. Well, it's. I would oh, say very D- Dutch East India companies. That that's changing the world. Well, exactly. They're both changing the world. It, yeah, I mean Dutch East India ways, in, in different ways. Sure, sure. World's unexplored and Dutch East India companies opening up global trade and going to places that never, have never been visited right. before. And they're the first public company uh, that we have record of anyway. Uh, adjusted for inflation in 1637, they were worth 7.9 trillion. So we're talking about. Apple and Amazon edging up towards a trillion yeah. dollar market cap, and Dutch East India Company is worth almost eight, eight trillion, um, and that was around the time of the tulip mania bubble. So some people might say, well, that was just a, a bubble, uh, but you know, if if we take the efficient market approach, it's not a bubble. It's just that people had those were the expectations. Correct. Just like That's Amazon. It's only a now. bubble in hindsight. Exactly. That's what Eugene Fahm yeah. always says, is that you, you can't call it a bubble unless you can tell me when it's going to end. Correct. Um, and that's the, the big challenge with being a growth investor, is that it's like, yeah, we can see now that Amazon and Apple and Google, they're, they've increased in value a ton. And if you invested in them five years ago or whatever, you made lots and lots of money. But now we're here. Now they, what do you they, do? They've done that. Now what? Especially in the light of all the science that's been done that shows that value stocks, those stocks that have not done well, typically do better going forward than those that have gone up dramatically. That's the, that's the toughest thing. If you, don't, if you don't get the winning growth stocks, which we can't see until right. they've won, if you don't get those ones and you just say, well, let's invest in all the growth stocks, you underperform value. You yep. underperform market. Yep. Yeah. It's tough, uh, tough stuff being a growth investor. Not to mention the volatility. Like I, I don't know, it was a while ago I saw Somebody did a post on uh, what what you would have had to endure to get the gains of Amazon, and it's like insane drops, right? Because it's a growth Many company. Times. Many yes. times, that's right. So it's not just well, you know, invest and close your eyes and hold on. You've got to endure these massive, massive yep. drops and not sell. 
keeping in mind that at some point you do have to sell because growth growth, growth companies don't perform well over the very long term. Uh, so you uh, you want to talk about Scotia's acquisition? Well, we talked about Scotia's acquisition of MD Management last week. Yeah. And that the fact they bought the big money manager in Montreal, Jaroslawski Fraser. Yeah. And now TD has just picked up uh, Greystone Investments. Yeah. Uh, this thought surprised me. You're now saying that TD is Canada's largest asset manager, even above Royal Bank. Yeah, that's what the article said. I didn't I didn't verify that, but that's what the uh, that's what this article said. So it really makes you wonder. Maybe it doesn't make you wonder, but I mean the banks are all about delivering shareholder return. That's right. their that's their mandate. That's right. TD did not acquire Greystone with the intention of giving their clients more fiduciary service. I think that's safe to say, yeah. right? So it's a different, I mean, it's very different than how our firm is structured. I mean, not that we're a, a not-for-profit, but clearly the motivation here, I mean, being owner-operated, the motivation is to, you know, take care of clients in a fiduciary type of environment and what will be for the company will be for the company. And we've always, I mean, we're very conservatively structured, owner-operated type company, but it's a very different mandate than I, I think it's safe to say a typical bank environment type company. When you start looking at the bank brokerages, and they they had, what was it, two years ago that all the banks were, were uh, cutting revenue payouts if your numbers were below a right. certain threshold? Like if yep. you're not making half a million dollars, your payout is decreasing? Yep. So they put a ton of pressure on their advisors to crank revenue. And we just don't, we don't have that. Like obviously we, we want revenue because that is our income, but there's no one breathing down our neck saying you have to produce this much revenue. I even heard of like floor space, depending on your revenue and your team, you get a certain amount of floor space and, and person count, which I, I get it on a national scale, you have hundreds if not thousands of advisors, it matters. It's just not the environment that we we could work in. Right. None of us. And that's why we're independent and have committed to remaining independent. And thankfully, we have not been on embedded commission for years. We have a few smaller accounts that are, have some embedded commission, but that's going away very quickly. And that's, I mean, we talk about embedded commissions like they're the, the devil, but this is embedded commissions on a DFA fund yeah, that just happened to be the most efficient thing to use for that person at that time. Correct. It doesn't change our compensation in the end. It's just, it's still embedded, but we're changing that. But it's a very, very small part of our overall And there's no revenue. DSC fees. Like this is still back-end load. index funds. It's it's not- Is back-end uh, load even used anymore? Can you use back-end load uh, funds anymore? So the CSA proposals we talked about uh, in our very first episode, I think that they've eliminated. I think they've eliminated DSC entirely. I know investors groups stopped doing it last year, but you start looking at the CRM two disclosures that, that are now in place, and no one's going to do DSC when they know the client's going to see you. They made thirty grand or whatever on the sale. Yeah, you do no eight hundred thousand dollar purchase, you get a thirty thousand dollar commission. I don't think people would tolerate that. No one's going to do that. And I remember back in ninety five when we last did it. I mean the. Revenue was ridiculous, so we put a stop to it right away. We just couldn't take it. Well, that was one of the red flags for you when you realized the model wasn't sustainable. Correct. Yeah, I mean, it just didn't I mean, make we sense. We were felt good about the work we were doing, but it's like it's not this good. You start getting five or six percent of every dollar coming in. People, I mean, we didn't at the time, but you hear people doing million dollar buys. You're getting a fifty or sixty thousand dollar commission. So all you, you're comp is all front end loaded, but people want long-term service. I mean, it's complete incongruity, so it makes no sense at all. Meanwhile, you're being told by the fund company that their active manager is what your client needs. Yeah, we were actually trained to fight against index funds, and why index funds makes no sense. I look back now, and it's it was absurd. I remember that. I remember in my the year that I spent in the active mutual fund commission business, uh, Fidelity had a whole slide deck to rebut against index funds. Like, here are the arguments to tell your clients. Just nonsense. And you know what it was? It it, it focused so much on, look at these funds. Like, look at these five funds. They've outperformed the index. So therefore, indexing doesn't make sense. Therefore, go sell these funds. Yeah, crazy. But if you don't know, if you don't have the framework as an advisor to understand why that is insane, it's really hard to... uh, Right, but you have an engineering background, MBA background, and you didn't know. Right, at the time, yeah. But I figured it out pretty quick to my credit. Come on. I, I, that's my point. <laughs> but but most, most people don't. But not every advisor has an right. MBA engineering right. background. Right. I've read a couple of things about expected consolidation in the Canadian asset management space just due to these new regulations that the CSA is rolling out. 
Um, there was a letter written by Ian Russell, who's the president of the Investment Industry Association of Canada, I- IIAC. Uh, he wrote uh, a lot about, well, basically what I said, that he expects there to be a lot of consolidation, and he's worried about the industry, and he's worried about the clients, and he thinks that firms might have to close because they can't deal with the new compliance requirements and they uh, can't deal with having to uh, disclose all the embedded commissions and things like that. I thought that was pretty interesting because all of those things are just non-issues for us. Right. We are independent, uh, but we're also financially stable as a firm. We're big enough, I think, that we're we've got some scale. And all the disclosure we've been doing since before it was required fee based Correct. we've been doing that since way before yep. um, it was even a trend yeah so i'm not too not too worried about all of that famous last words maybe but in the end people want to deal with people they know and like and trust that are going to be here the bank model is to in my opinion keep you dedicated to the bank brand and whoever is in that seat happens to be the person of that day but over time i hear people tiring of telling their story over and over again Whereas here we know the people, our team knows everybody, so it's a whole different environment. Yeah, yeah, that, and that's totally what people want. I, I think that's a, the people that our clients want that anyway. That, but that's why they're clients. But how can I you guess. give advice if you don't know the client? Like really know the client. Like what are they thinking? What's going oh, on in their lives? I, I, you can't, you can't walk up to a counter and expect adequate, thoughtful advice. Sure, that's at the bank branch. But even you, you look at most most people giving financial advice, and I mean I, I'm not in everybody's office. I don't know. But a lot of people out there are still giving advice based on either product or security selection with no, not even a consideration for financial planning advice. And it's like, yeah, you don't know the client. You know their portfolio. You know which stock you're going to recommend to buy next or which fund or whatever. But that's totally different from our model. And I mean, you look back, that's even before indexing was part of PWL. That was the business model. It was the, the, the combination of planning and like financial advice and portfolio management, which nobody was doing at the time. It's that integration. And I'm sure people are doing it out there. It's more common now. But I've sat in, I've sat a number of common meetings with clients and their other advisor and the stories that come out about the picks that they're doing. It's, it, it's crazy to me when you know the academic evidence that this is basically nonsense. It does not have a higher expected return. Do we have a lot of clients with, with multiple advisors? I've got a couple I've done. I've just seen it firsthand or heard the stories. Huh. Really interesting. Um, Jonathan Clements had a neat post that you you sent me over the weekend. Uh, I don't remember what the title was, but he was writing about how he's still waiting for all these predictions to come to fruition. So, like and these are predictions he made like twenty years ago. I think they're just general predictions. But these he talks about in the article going back years, waiting for these things yeah. to happen. So stocks returning to their historical valuations was an interesting one. Interest rates rising, inflation coming back. Uh, aggressively, all this kind of stuff. But he's basically saying all the stuff that people always worry about or say, you know, this is going to happen tomorrow, it hasn't happened. And he's speculating. He doesn't think it's going to happen now. Who knows? And and Rob Arnott in that podcast this morning I listened to with Barry Ritholtz talked about how this is why you have high, higher expect returns in the markets is to put up with this worrying. So get used to worrying. Right. Like worrying is normal. And we've heard everything over the years. There's always something to worry about which is why you have higher expected returns. Right. And to have a plan in place and an asset allocation in place such that when the markets do move around, for whatever reason, you rebalance automatically. Right. Yeah, I wrote a post about uncertainty this week. Um, I think Nassim Taleb in his book, Anti-Fragile, defined uncertainty really nicely when he's talking about black swans, he says an annoying aspect of the black swan problem. In fact, the central and largely missed point is that the odds of rare events are simply not computable. So we talk a lot about uncertainty and and volatility in the stock market and things like that. But the reality is uncertainty is not something that can be measured. Um, And I think that based on the human biases that affect all of our thinking, at any given time, the world feels as uncertain as it's ever felt. Um, I always However, think that we've had like 10 years now of good equity returns, and we just put out our performance reports. Returns have been good for balanced portfolios. But when you isolate the bond returns, the fixed income returns, they're flat plus or minus a little bit for the past year, which has caused some clients to ask, like, why do I hold these things? I could have bought a GIC and had a guaranteed rate. Or why didn't I have all equity? 
So people are becoming kind of forgetting what the risk was like back in 2008. Because I remember 2008, people wanted to increase their allocation right. to bonds after 2008 happened. Right. So huge recency bias going on. Always. And you start looking at world events like Trump and potential wars and all that other stuff that happens in the world. And at any given time, it feels like, you know, this is new, that there's a, a potential trade war, that's a new thing, or that there's a potential war, that's a new thing. Those things aren't new. They've been happening forever. Um, so in that blog post that I wrote about uncertainty, I looked at, now I'm going to talk about volatility. Volatility is not a great measure of uncertainty. Uh, but no. when you think about uncertainty, if if people, if investors start to view the market as being riskier or they anticipate uh, they anticipate worse economic times, discount rates might increase, which means stock valuations have to decrease. because Which stock, means they have higher expected returns which, which, to compensate you to hold to take the risk. Right. Well, that's the discount rate. The, the discount rate increases. Yeah, you're right. Prices come down, which means the expected return uh, the expected return goes up. Um, so anyway, on the topic of volatility, I wanted to see what has volatility been like in the past. So I went and took the CRISP 110 index, so that's the total U.S. market, uh, and I looked at the 10-year standard deviation for each decade starting in 1926. Oh, yeah. So 1926 to 1936 and yeah, so on. 1926 1936, standard deviation was high. Like 30, uh, mid 30s, right? Yeah, 30, 31, uh, which was high. Every other decade, pretty close in the sort of 16, 15 to 17 sort of range. Uh, so that means the return, the annual return could swing plus or minus that amount 65% of the time. Yeah, two thirds of the time. Yeah. But the, the interesting observation was that 10 year standard deviation has been pretty much constant over time. And I think people have a feeling that, you know, with Trump and things like that, we're in unprecedented times. I don't think, I mean, there's been stuff happening in the world always. Yes. So well, when, when your portfolio is 17% lower than you expect, everybody wants to attribute a reason. And when something happens, much like in a car crash, you want to do something to, pre to prevent the crash because you have this emotional need to feel like you stepped in, right? No, right. stick to the policy, rebalance your portfolio. Right. Yeah. And even in good times like now, there's always stocks that are falling in price. So for someone to hold them, because remember, everybody, every stock has to always be held by someone. And every stock is traded. Therefore, all information is priced into it. Price discovery happens all the time. Someone's going to hold it. They're going to pay you less, which means they have to take on a higher expected return to take on that risk. So I think it's a risk story. It is. It's always a risk story. I, I listened to that Rob Arnott podcast this morning too. And uh, one of the things that was really interesting that he talked about, and I've, I've heard this before from, I think, Patrick O'Shaughnessy, um, but just about how the, the, the value return comes from rebalancing, which obviously, like you buy a value stock, when it stops being a value stock is when you get the higher return. It's gone up. Exactly. So you're selling high. Correct. Taking those proceeds and going, buying, going and buying something that went down. Exactly. And you got this machinery going on all the time much like a small cap. Well, if some stock became a small cap, it's because it was a big cap, which means it went down in price. So it's really a price story. Or if so, you own all the small caps and they stop being small caps, which some of them will, and you rebalance out of them into more small caps, you keep running the same machinery. And you're people always- People get this. When I explain this to people, they get it. It makes sense. It's the same thing between based. stocks and bonds, same thing. Yeah. It's exactly the same thing. It's just the, the, the rebalancing return that you're getting by rebalancing into the assets that are relatively low in price and out of the assets that are relatively high in price. Um, yeah, anything else? No, that's a pretty good list, I think, for uh, week three, I believe. This is episode number three. We'll be back next week.